appreciate your time today. I know that uh, there are a lot of demands on your Zoom time. So hopefully this is a worthwhile session. Uh, we have a lot to cover. I'm gonna try to go through the slides as quickly as I possibly can because I wanna save as much time as possible for your questions. Um, I appreciate you submitting your questions in advance when you register to attend. That's really helpful. I should be able to answer most of them uh, throughout the course of the presentation, but if I miss anything, please feel free to ask them again, either via the chat or you can unmute yourself at the end and ask me those questions. So let's get started. Um, the question I'm sure, um, actually go back one slide, please. The question I'm sure that is on all of your minds, um, and I definitely saw this in the questions that were submitted, what does study abroad look like? What does study abroad planning look like during this time of COVID? Um, this has been a very, very challenging uh, past seven, eight, nine, ten months for our field. We really started um, seeing the effects of this back in January, having programs uh, and universities cancel programs, having to pull students back from abroad and bring them home. Um, and so we've learned a lot and our entire industry has been able to pivot pretty significantly during this time. So our kind of go-to plan for, for anyone who's thinking about studying abroad during this, this time is to plan to study abroad. Make your plans, go about your process, but have a plan B. So plan A is for you to go abroad during the time that you're thinking of and the location that you've always wanted to go to and do all the things that you've always wanted to do. But this uh, smart plan is to also have a plan B. So if you are thinking about studying abroad for next fall, for example, fall 2021, that's great. Uh, right now, summer 2021 and fall 2021, this is our normal cycle for that time of year. We are normally working with students who are planning to study abroad summer, fall 2021 or academic year 2021-2022. Go ahead and plan that. It's looking like all of our programs are going to be back up and running by summer 2021. We have every hope that things will start to return to new normal then. However, we are working with all of our students to make sure that they are enrolling in courses at UCSD as a backup plan or whatever your normal uh, term would look like to make sure that you still uh, remain on track for graduation. So that's really important. So have your plan A. Your plan A is to go abroad when you're normally planning to do it. Your plan B is to go ahead and take courses on campus or whatever that normal term would look like. All right, next slide. Uh, we definitely want to highlight virtual study abroad and virtual internships. A lot of you asked about this in your questions that you sent me, and uh, our industry has pivoted significantly to expand our global uh, learning opportunities, both for study abroad and for interning abroad. And this is great because uh, for a lot of students, traveling to another country is not something that they were able to do for a myriad of reasons. Um, but this allows the entire globe to be at your fingertips. So you can literally enroll in a study abroad program, take your courses online or remote, the same way you're doing here at UCSD, but be attending another university abroad, uh, be engaged with students from all over the world, be engaged with faculty from all over the world. Um, and so if it feels like studying abroad is not something you can do uh, for financial reasons or any number of other reasons due to COVID-19, we would uh, encourage you to consider a, a virtual program. The costs are much, 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 much lower, obviously, than going in person. Um, and so that it kind of brings the, the entry point to a more accessible area for a lot of students. Um, when it comes to global internships, for those of you who are currently in your senior year, and it's not looking like study abroad is something that you can make happen this year, if you're not planning to do a program this coming summer 2021, I would encourage you to add a global internship onto your either your winter or spring term um, or to your summer term. This is an incredible opportunity to gain skills that are going to be very much sought after now. So the minimum point of entry at this point in our new, in our new globe um, for any job is going to be the ability to work remotely. So major companies and collaborating remotely. If you don't know how to uh, really function from a remote place, um, then you're not prepared to enter the workplace. And the good news is you all are because you're already doing that right now with, with your schooling. So um, we highly encourage you to consider a global internship. The costs are in the ballpark of $1,500 for anywhere from eight to 12 weeks of an internship. 
that's pretty easy to tack on to your term and to be building a resume uh, with a global perspective with work experience while you're still living your remote life that you're living right now. So definitely something to consider. We have a ton of resources on our website and links to our virtual programs. Um, so check that out. Next slide. All right, so getting back to traditional study abroad and just planning in general, there's so much to think about and all of this came across in the questions that you submitted. When is the best time for me to go? What type of program should I be looking at? Where should I go? Um, how am I going to pay for this? Do I need to be able to speak the host language? How might my identity factor into my time abroad, the intersections of my identity? And we're going to talk about that. And of course, how is this going to fit into my overall academic plan? Um, especially if you're a transfer student, you may be on a limited time scope. Um, so we're going to break all of this down in these next few slides. Next slide, please. All right, so best time to go. That question is really different for each and every one of you. It really depends on a lot of different factors. Your academic plan, uh, are you transfer, are you already in your third year, when is the best time for you to go is really dependent on uh, what you individually have going on. Do you have family responsibilities? Do you have work responsibilities? Um, is there a specific sequence of courses that you need to be virtually on campus to take at a, at a given time. We don't want you to miss any important courses that aren't going to be offered again uh, during the rest of your time at UCSD. So it's really important to engage your academic advisors to determine when is the best time for me specifically based on my academic plan to go. And then um, have a conversation with yourself, have a conversation with your family. Uh, when is the best time for me to go based on the other demands of my time? So we're in the quarter system. Most of the rest of the world is on the semester system. So for a lot of our students, going abroad during the fall quarter is the best time for them to go abroad because um, when you participate in a fall semester program during our fall quarter, you're only missing our fall quarter time. So fall semester programs generally run from August or early September through December. So it's about a month to six weeks longer uh, than our quarter. If you are participating in a spring semester program, that means you're going to be gone for our winter and spring quarter. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, for most of our students, they're taking anywhere from 18 to 26 UC quarter units abroad during a semester program. So in the fall, that's much, much more than you would be taking on our campus. During spring, maybe, uh, winter, spring, maybe not so much. So that, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and we do everything really far in advance. So in terms of application deadlines, if you're thinking about studying abroad perhaps next summer or next fall, really your time to begin this process is right now. Our applications for summer and fall are open now. Deadlines for summer and fall are mostly in January, February, and March. And so you really need to be going through this process, meeting with your advisors, taking a look at programs, taking a look at courses right now. So if you are planning to go next summer or fall and you haven't connected with us, please do. We wanna get you going on that right away. Uh, we have data to prove that studying abroad, um, students who study abroad graduate more on time or earlier than students that don't. And that's because of all the academic planning that's involved in that process. Um, and so if you're worried about how this is going to fit into your schedule, we are here to work through that with you. Um, especially if you go abroad in the summer, this could be an opportunity to open up space in your schedule to pursue other things, um, get some courses done during that summertime that you might normally have to get done during the school year. All right, next slide. Okay, location. So we have a lot of program options, a lot of program options, something like 500 different program options in over 50 different countries. So that's a lot to narrow down. You may already have a specific country in mind or at least a specific region, but there may be many, many program options available within that country and certainly within that region. Um, so even if you're in the very early stages, if you're a first year student or a second year student, we really want you to start thinking about where have you always pictured yourself going abroad? Where's a place that you could see? Uh, we can certainly make program recommendations based on your major, and we're going to take a look at those programs later, but you may have a dream location in mind, um, and we want you to be able to follow your dream. So if you've always dreamt of studying in Paris, we want you to study in Paris. Um, in Germany. Um, but you may not find the, the exact right type of courses that you're looking to take. So we encourage you to get into the course catalogs, take a look at the courses available, and that will help you narrow down like, oh, I can definitely study in Germany, but I can't study at this specific host institution. I may need to look at this other host institution. Uh, what type of housing is available in the locations that you're looking at? Uh, is it a dorm? 
Is it an off-campus apartment? Is it living with a host family? That's called a homestay. You may have something specific in mind in terms of your housing option, and that may help you narrow down program options as well. Um, we live in a pretty urban location, at, at least here in San Diego, where UC San Diego is located. Uh, this is, UC San Diego is a giant campus with tons and tons of students. You may want a completely different type of experience for your study abroad time. You may want to be in a small town at a smaller university with class sizes no bigger than 20. That's totally an option. You can find programs based on those specs, but really kind of think about what you're looking for in this experience. Next slide. All right, this question came up a lot, language. Do I need to speak the host language in order to study uh, in a non-English speaking country? And the answer is no. For any of our program options around the world, for any of our locations around the world, we're always going to have at least one program option where the courses are taught in English. So the vast majority of our students when they're studying abroad are taking their courses in English. Many of them, and we definitely encourage this, are also studying the host language or taking a class or two in the host language, but there, our students are taking their courses in English. If you have been studying a language and you have enough uh, capability to take your courses in the host language, we absolutely encourage that. If you're a native speaker, you can of course take your courses in the host language, but for the most part our students are taking their courses in English. If you're thinking about studying abroad in a specific location where the majority of the courses are in the host language, and especially if you're in your first year, this might be a time to consider um, how much language study you might need to do over the course of the next couple years to be eligible to take courses in the host language. So some of our programs will have a minimum language requirement, something like five quarters of the host language. You definitely have time to get that done between now and when you might go abroad, let's say um, fall of your junior year, or fall of your senior year. Um, so take, uh, take note of that now, pay attention to that now and adjust your schedule accordingly if that's something that you'd like to do. Next slide. All right, finances, this is a big one. So um, for those of you who receive financial aid, which should be something in the ballpark of about 63% of you, uh, your financial aid can be applied towards the cost of your study abroad program. So one thing you can do is take a look at your financial aid award letter for this fall um, and see the different aid that you received grants, loans, scholarships, federal and state aid, UC aid. What you receive this fall will be pretty similar to what you receive next fall unless your financial situation changes drastically. And that's based on the FAFSA that you complete every year. Um, so you can take a look at that financial aid award letter, get an idea of how much you normally receive in aid. And then when you're taking a look at program costs, keep that number in mind as you see those uh, um, price tags on the programs. So you may say, okay, I receive um, $12,000 in financial aid. Uh, that's a pretty good amount and this program costs fifteen thousand dollars that means i'd have about three thousand dollars in uncovered cost how can i make that up the answer is uh, in short scholarships so we have tons of study abroad scholarships available through our office through the actual study abroad programs that you're going to be applying to there are big national study abroad scholarships that i get all of the that our students get all of the time and we want you to apply for everything that you're eligible for um, so one scholarship to highlight uh, is called the Gilman Scholarship, big national study abroad scholarship, ultimately through the State Department. And so for those of you who are Pell eligible, it means you're eligible for the Gilman Scholarship, which gives up to $5,000 for the cost of your study abroad program. That's a ton of money. And so that then when you take a look at that $3,000 price difference, um, when you see a scholarship like that, it seems very, very doable. In most cases, our students are getting multiple scholarships to apply towards the cost of study abroad. There is, of course, always the option to um, apply for additional loan funds or take out additional loans, um, but we are not, you know, really trying to encourage students to do that unless it's absolutely necessary. So we definitely want you to apply for as many scholarships as possible. We gave out actually $980,000 in um, financial aid and scholarships last year, which is a ton of money for our students. Um, but I think realistically, we may see some scholarship opportunities shrinking over the course of the next couple of years due to um, really financial the big ones like, like the Gilman and the ones offered through our partners like UCEAP, which we'll talk about soon, um, should remain. We also offer scholarship essay writing workshops and financial aid literacy workshops throughout, um, especially during winter quarter, because a lot of um, summer fall scholarships are due in um, March. So we work with students in a workshop style. 
to help them to learn um, what we're looking for when we are reading study abroad scholarships. Everyone in the office sits on tons of scholarship boards so we know exactly what they're looking for and we coach you through how to write the best essay possible because we want you to get that aid. We want you to get that money towards the cost of your program. So look out for stuff like that coming your way later on this term. Next slide. All right, academics. So we want you to stay on track for graduation. Studying abroad should not delay your track for graduation, but that requires lots and lots of academic planning and planning in advance. Plan early, get advised. That's what we tell students all the time. If it's your first term here, that means it's time to connect with our office. Um, you're here in this presentation right now, which is great, but we want you to get this information early, start planning and be advised by your, both your major advisor, your minor advisor, and your college advisor on when is the best time for you to go abroad? How is this going to fit into your, to your overall academic plan? Um, and Natalie, and then just a little bit, we'll talk about um, how study abroad is going to, uh, or how you can have your units transferred into your poli-sci major, um, but kind of getting all that sorted out in advance is really important. Um, we talked about internships. I didn't mention research earlier. Uh, there's also the opportunity to do undergraduate research abroad. And in many cases, your internship or research uh, can come in as uh, academic credit. You can take the internship or do the research for academic credit, and that can work towards fulfilling your graduation requirements. So definitely something to keep in mind. And then in all cases, you'll be, be petitioning your courses upon return to campus. Next slide. All right, so your identity matters. Your identity matters here on campus. Your identity matters in your remote location. And it absolutely matters when you're studying abroad. And the intersections of your identity may play a really big part in your overall study abroad experience. And we want to make sure that you have the resources that you need in advance so you know how to best navigate your time abroad. And so we have this really great site developed with a ton of information and resources and student narratives about what it's like to be a black queer student abroad, what it's like to be a heritage seeking student in your country of heritage and not speaking the host language, things like that. Um, so check this stuff out. If you're, if we're missing something, if there's something you're looking for that you don't see there, please let us know. Um, we'd love to connect you to any and all kinds of resources that you need to be successful during your time abroad. Okay, so we got a lot of study different types of study abroad programs out there. Today, we're just gonna focus on um, four of the different types of programs that are most um, relevant to you all as political science students. So let's get into it. Next slide, please. All right, so the University of California Education Abroad Program or UCEAP. So the UC is so large, we essentially have our own study abroad provider called UCEAP. Um, it's, a, it's a way to leverage the power of the entire University of California for exchange around the world. So you can study abroad as a UC student, you will remain a UC student, you'll be earning UC credit, but studying at universities and programs around the world. So again, you'll be earning UC credit, means you can keep all of your financial aid, your state aid, your federal aid, your UC aid, um, and you don't have to worry about whether or not those courses will transfer back to UC San Diego because they're already considered UC credit. You just have to petition them to fulfill your specific requirements, so your political science requirements or your college GE requirements. Um, I, there are UC EAP programs literally all over the world uh, quarter, semester, academic year, summer options, virtual internships, virtual study abroad, anything and everything is available through UCEAP. So when you visit their website, um, it might be a little bit overwhelming just the sheer volume of programs they have available, but know that we are here to help you narrow those program options down. And really as you start to take a look at uh, the length of time, the cost, the courses available in each program, your list should start to narrow down from there. So that's UCEAP. Let's move on to our Opportunities Abroad Program, or OAP. It's really important for us that students find a program that is the absolute best fit for you. That may be different than your friend or your partner. And so, if you have a, that you feel is a better fit, we want you to be able to, to participate in that program. So we have a process for you to earn transfer credit, which means your courses come in as transfer credit, not UC credit, and still participate in those programs. You can still take your state and federal financial aid on any OAP program, um, but you would not be able to take your UC aid. So if you are receiving UC aid and it's significant, 
OAP may not be the best fit for you. We have lots of scenarios where students uh, choose to do an OAP program. One of the most popular reasons students choose to do that is if they are international students or non-resident students. UCEAP is going to charge the non-resident fee, usually a non-resident semester fee for participation in a study abroad program. Um, and so if you want to avoid paying that as an international student or a non-resident student, then OAP would be the route for you. Usually the exact same universities that UCEAP partners with are available through OAP and many, many more. So be sure to check those out as well on our website. Um, you may also find study abroad programs through our other UC campuses. I would say UC Davis and UCLA's programs are most popular with our students, especially their summer programs. Uh, we want you to do those too. That's great. We are fully in support of students studying abroad through the other UCs. Um, you can keep your UC aid. You're going to earn UC credit. Um, so definitely check those program options out. In fact, I'm going to mention one of them later when I, when I uh, share about poli-sci programs that we recommend. All right, I'll hand it over to Natalie. All right. Hi, everyone, again. Um, so again, I am your advisor for political science, and we definitely encourage our students to go abroad um, as much as possible and whenever they can. And so we do have a page that's dedicated to studying abroad on our department website. So that information is always there um, for you to review and explore. But of course, you would connect with me through the Virtual Advising Center um, on any specific questions regarding uh, your requirements, what your plan looks like, and when would be the best time for you to go. Um, so, you know, Andra shared a lot of information about this of what you do before studying abroad. So, you know, what you see on the screen um, is again in line with what we expect from you before you do go abroad. And this screen is just a screenshot of that department page that I was talking to you about. And of course, it goes on uh, beyond what you see here. Uh, but it is important that you all visit this website sooner rather than later. Um, you don't see it on this screenshot, but off to the left underneath the section that says study abroad for political science, I've created um, separate pages for the different types of programs that students um, go abroad for. Um, and then on those separate sites, I've also linked important information um, for uh, those web pages. So for example, there's a page for UCEAP. And then when you go in that specific page, there are more specific links that are beneficial for you as a student. So as far as requirements um, and studying abroad, um, so if you want to go study abroad and you plan to take political science courses abroad, um, that's awesome. So our rule is that uh, students who are political science majors, uh, they can transfer in up to six courses from outside UCSD into their major requirements. Um, so all of our majors have 16 classes. So to be able to transfer in up to six uh, from outside the university is a pretty great ratio, um, in my opinion. Um, so we just require that the courses you transfer in are political science courses, that they transfer into UCSD as upper division courses, that they transfer in um, with four or more quarter units each, and that you earn a letter grade of C minus or better in that class. And so uh, for those of you who are transfer students um, or for those of you who um, took AP classes or maybe you know, one or two uh, political science courses in community college or another university, just keep in mind that those classes do count as transfer courses. Um, so sometimes I work with uh, maybe a transfer student who completed three of their lower division political science courses at their previous institution. So I would tell them that they um, can transfer in up to three more classes um, outside of the university into their major. So if you have any questions about what that looks like for you and what you're planning on for the future, um, just communicate with me through the Virtual Advising Center um, and I can share with you what you've transferred in and how much you have left. Um, and really as you know, I always share with students and what Andra has shared as well is that it's super important to plan ahead and plan early. So 
uh, the better that I know what you want for yourself as a political science student, um, the easier it is for me to help guide you to the correct folks on campus and to really show you what's possible. So, um, you know, don't wait. Um, definitely just ask. It's better to get the information now and make steady progress with it and then, you know, go do whatever you want to do um, when you want to do it. Um, then wait until the last minute. Um, so with that said, um, I'm going to hop this conversation back on over to Andra so she can talk about some different uh, political science programs that you all might be interested in. All right, um, and a couple things I want to, I was just checking the question list to make sure I'm capturing everything. Somebody had asked about um, how can I participate in studying abroad without delaying my degree completion? And I just want to reiterate that um, you all are really lucky to be in political science because they're so flexible. You heard Natalie say that you can transfer up to six courses in uh, to the poli-sci major, which is, I think, more than any other department on campus. Uh, and so you're taking courses abroad that you would otherwise be taking on campus. So it's not like you're not making progress towards your degree while you're studying abroad. But the great thing about studying abroad is it opens up a whole world of possibilities in terms of courses that UCSD is never going to offer, or doesn't have in the course catalog. And so you'll be focusing on those upper division major electives. So kind of as long as it's upper division and within the realm of political science, for the most part, poli sci is gonna be willing to approve that. So you'll be able to take courses that uh, you've always or maybe you never even dreamed would be available to you and have those transfer into the major. So that's what's great about that. All right, so we're gonna take a look at some different programs. Um, and when we say, when I say recommend, like the list of programs out there that I would recommend for political science is lengthy and we do not have the time to go through all of them. So I pulled like some of my most favorites out there. I apologize that the first several that we're gonna go through are all in Europe. Please know there are many, many, many program options all over the world not in Europe. Um, but these are just kind of some exciting ones that are very popular with our students. So this first program is uh, through our partner IES Abroad. They fall into our OAP program category. So they're a non-UC program. Uh, the first program is called the European Union Program. I had the opportunity to um, visit this program on site back in 2018, and I can definitely attest to the amount of work the students put into preparing for the exciting travel components that are a part of this program. So if you're studying the EU, you can't just be in one location in Europe. You have to be able to see what the EU really looks like on the ground in multiple countries. And that's kind of the idea of this program. So the students have class throughout the week in Freiburg, Germany, where the program is based. And they have uh, multiple different trips throughout the semester where they're visiting different parts of Europe uh, for very strategic reasons based on their interest. So if your interest is the UN, if your interest is European security, if your interest is uh, European economics, your visits will match that. And the students have to do a ton of prep because once you're on site, you're going to be interviewing or working on projects with local leaders or EU leaders, and the students have to do a ton of prep work in advance for that. So it's pretty exciting what they get access to. The types of folks within the EU that they've been able to interview um, are pretty incredible. So I love this program. Uh, it is on the more expensive side, but it's because of the travel component that's a part of that program. Um, and then if you are going during the spring semester, there is an optional internship. I will say that they are likely putting this program on hold. Um, or redesigning it fully for 2021, 2022 um, because of the travel component. And this goes to one of the questions I saw that you all submitted. The way study abroad is going to change for the next two years probably will be a limit on travel. So one of the most exciting things about studying abroad for students is the opportunity to travel to multiple countries, especially if you're going to, let's say, Europe. There are so many different countries you can go to during your time there. I would imagine that that will be limited, right? Right now for our students who are planning to go abroad um, for our spring quarter programs, they will be limited on their travel to staying within their specific to field trips that go beyond um, the host country itself. So programs like this, multi-country programs like this, which have been one of the most exciting types of programs that we offer, will probably be temporarily on hold or, or will be redesigned to remain within one country. 
Another program to mention through IES Abroad is the International Affairs and Security Studies program. If you're really interested in security studies, um, this is a really cool program based at their center in Berlin, Germany. Um, I think students who participate in this program are usually leaning towards international law um, or uh, international security. So this is a pretty exciting option. And there's an automatic $2,000 UCSD grant for our students. All right, next slide. All right, so this is a UC EAP program at Sciences Po, which is like a premier political science institute in France. They have a campus in Reims, France, and a campus in Paris, France. Um, the program in Reims is a lot cheaper, so I always like to talk about it first. Um, you have to take six courses. French language is one of your courses, so the other five courses can all be political science. They do offer a few other um, relatable subject areas, but it's mostly poli-sci. And when I say Premier Institute, I really mean Premier Institute. They have high minimum GPA requirements. The students who are studying at this school who are degree-seeking students are deep in the political science realm. This is what they're doing. So you're studying with sort of like the elite poli-sci students of the world. Um, Hans does not have a minimum language requirement for participation. Um, and I will say Paris, they just suggested this. I should have changed this slide. It no longer requires two years of French language. However, the number of courses that they offer in English are a little more limited. So it's helpful if you've had two years of French language because it means more course options will be available to you in French than in English. Um, and you do have to take two of your courses in French. It's a requirement. Um, so something to keep in mind. Next slide. All right, so this is another UCEAP program in Geneva, Switzerland. It's focused on the UN. There are internships available. Um, they only offer this program during spring semester, so that's winter and spring. Um, let me see. You know, Switzerland's not the least expensive, most cost-effective place to study. It's very expensive to study in Switzerland. Uh, that's just kind of like a straight up thing, but I would say 17,200 for a spring semester. So that's two quarter length of a program um, is, not, is not too terrible. Uh, again, if you're focused on the UN specifically within political science or international relations, this is a great, great program option. Next program. Again, UCEAP, this is social justice and activism in Paris. Um, this is a winter quarter program, or you can do a spring semester program. Um, there are internships available if you're a junior or senior participating in the program, and all the courses that they offer are upper div poli science, social science program uh, courses. I, I like this program because the minimum GPA requirements requirement is only a 2.5, so it means a lot of students are able to access this program, and the quarter price is uh, not too, too bad. So something to keep in mind. Those are actual students from the first term that this program ran um, from across the UC. And then SIT Study Abroad falls into our OAP program category. They are, I think, probably one of the most dynamic study abroad programs in existence. They were one of the first to start doing thematic programs, meaning uh, they set a theme for a location and all the courses follow that theme. So you can see they offer peace and conflict studies in Serbia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. Um, this, the program in the middle, the IHP Rethinking Food Security Program, is a comparative lens program. So students move uh, through three regions of the world to to do a comparative lens study of food security or um, social justice or international security from the lens of those three regions of the world. Um, and they change every year depending on the geopolitical situations happening uh, at the time. So these are just three examples, um, but they change all the time. So I would encourage you to check out their website. I think the international studies and multilateral diplomacy, if I were gonna go back in time to when I studied abroad, I studied abroad in Sicily when I was a student. If I were going to go back in time, this is the program I would do. I love that it's a multi-country program focused on international studies and multilateral. It allows you to kind of do a culmination of everything that you've learned and those and then students have the opportunity to present at conferences around the world depending on um, 
the depth of their work. So know that that's available to you. Um, our students regularly receive $5,000 in scholarships from SAT and they also match up to $5,000 of your, of your Pell Grants. It's pretty incredible. Okay, next program. All right, so these are other UC poli-sci programs that I recommend. I know that that was really Europe focused earlier. Um, so these are programs that I recommend from all over the world and I updated these prices this morning. So these are the freshest of prices available. Um, our pro program at uh, Meiji Gaikun University in Yokohama, Japan, is focused on global and international studies. Really, really great prices for uh, these programs. Some of the lowest you'll see. Um, for some of you, that's going to be like the same or less than you're spending for your term here at UCSD. There's a UCAP Irish Parliamentary Internship Program. We also have a very, very similar program in Scotland. Um, I, I have less students apply for the Ireland program, so I guess that's probably why I put it on here, but know that the Scottish program is available as well. Uh, we have many, many, many English university uh, partnerships, but University of Kent is one of my favorites. Their political science department is next level. If any of you are looking at master's programs, I highly recommend their Brussels School of International Studies in Brussels, Belgium. Um, look at that price for the fall. That's so great for, a, for an English university. They're located in Canterbury, England. Um, you'll notice for a lot of these programs, their fall costs are cheaper than their spring costs. So if that's something to sway you to go for fall. University of Oslo and Oslo, Norway. Students never, ever, ever think of studying in Norway, but Oslo is such a cosmopolitan international city. It's a commerce center for Europe. I think it's a fabulous place for a political science student to study. Um, check it out. It's very, I mean, it kind of looks like the movie Frozen because that's basically what it's based on, but it is actually a very um, hustle bustle city. Oslo is a very hustle and bustle city. Um, we've got leadership in social justice and public policy at UNAM in Mexico. I think this is a really incredible program. Just be aware that it, it is a fall quarter and winter quarter program or winter and spring. Um, so you would be missing fall and winter if you decide to go for the fall. Keep that in mind. We've got another global and international focused program at Fudan University in Shanghai. Another great price for fall. And then if you would like to go with UC Davis to London School of Economics and Political Science, which is another premier political science and economics institute worldwide, you can do that. Normally to attend LSE during the school year, you have to apply to their program called the General Course, which is an academic year length program. But you can study through UC Davis. It's basically a faculty-led program at LSE um, for the fall quarter only. And right now they've pushed, obviously, they're not, they didn't run this fall, so they will be, they have every plan to run again next fall 2021. Whew, okay, that was a lot of programs. <laughs> next slide. I want to go back to virtual international internships. UCEAP just partnered with um, a company called CEA, which is one of our OEP affiliates, and uh, to expand their virtual internship opportunities. You can see if you look at down below at the About Program section, they've added Sevilla, Prague, Rome, Florence, Paris, Amsterdam, Barcelona, Sydney, Buenos Aires, and San Jose, Costa Rica. All virtual internship opportunities available. Um, and so I would definitely encourage you to check that out. As political science students, it's pretty critical that you have an internship on your resume. To have a global internship on your resume is even better leverage for you if you're planning to go to grad school or be competitive in the job market. And a virtual internship is going to have just as much value, if not more, moving forward than an in-person inter internship. So please check those out. Next slide. Okay. Your next steps are to begin researching program options, to get advised, to find out when is the best time for you specifically to go abroad so you can start planning for that time. Uh, start to limit down your program options because there's a lot out there. And if, for those of you who are planning to study abroad a year from now, the time to start is right now. So please visit, let's see what my next slide is. Yeah, you can schedule an appointment to meet with me specifically or anyone in our office um, via our virtual advising center. Um, you can message us in the back. You can send us an email. We do have a virtual front desk. We We have been in evening hours with our student workers who are recently returned study abroad students. So we are available for you virtually for 
I don't know, forever, for the foreseeable future. All right, so let's stop screen sharing this presentation.